Andy, here's some good news that it looks like winds are not going to hold us up. Five, four, three. This was definitely a milestone flight. It hit a lot of targets that it did not hit with the last integrated test flight. It was able to launch with all 33 Raptor engines. It was able to do a complete separation of the booster from Starship. It was able to relight some of those engines and do a test of the payload bay doors opening and closing them. It didn't quite get some of those final milestones that is landing or you know attempting a soft splash down in the ocean nor was the starship able to return to you know to the earth to re-entry however it did make it to space and that's the biggest milestone it made it to orbit and so this was a successful flight in my mind now the the next major milestone is going to be a hot staging maneuver again we're going to be doing that in just about 90 seconds to do that we're going to shut down though i mean congrats to the team making it this far is farther than we than we've gone absolutely on star command there you see it again this is uh, our mission control center at um and then you know there were also a couple of uh problems that happened with the uh, booster falling uh sort of uncontrolled into the ocean and then the uh, vehicle burning up on re-entry. But otherwise, this was the most successful flight so far. And what it speaks to is, you know, the eventual capability of using this vehicle to launch heavy payloads and uh, crews on longer trips, uh, like trips to the moon, such as what Artemis, uh, NASA's Artemis program is designed to do. We're getting a few, a few engines. So the heating and the loads that Starship is going through right now are what it would be getting if it were recovering from an orbital mission. And, and just the fact that we have views through entry, this is incredible. The heat shield tiles doing their work. We talked about- SpaceX's philosophy is more that, you know, they don't expect everything to go right. Um, they don't really, uh, or at least that's what they say publicly is that they, they don't expect everything to go right, but they expect things to improve over time. And that's worked well for them with their Falcon 9 rockets, which are now very profitable for the company. And I think they're expecting the same thing to be happening uh, in, in this case as well. And one thing that these launches definitely have done is that they've drummed up a lot of public enthusiasm for SpaceX and for this new um, super heavy launch vehicle. Now, Starship is a completely different vehicle. It's meant to be completely reusable at some point. It is meant to bring a whole lot more payload to space. It's even envisioned to bring 100 tons to the surface of the moon. Like That's what we're talking about, something that's never been fathomed before. It's also larger, much larger than Space Shuttle. So Space Shuttle had at its capacity seven people, seven crew. Um, we don't really know the official numbers with Starship, but it's envisioned that it could take 100 people or more in Starship. SpaceX also intends to take humans to the surface of Mars. In addition, there are other customers. There's the Department of Defense and there's private customers that intend to take use of Starship. Starship is the biggest and most powerful rocket ever built. It's bigger than Saturn V, which took astronauts to the moon in the 1960s and 70s. And there you see it again. This is uh, our mission control center at... We heard a call out for nominal orbital insertion, which is incredible. Look at these views, Dan. A 19-story tall Saturn was pushed into space by its one and a half million pounds of thrust as it spouted a flame longer than a football field. Missile men monitored... Pretty accurate that, uh, you know, back in the 1960s and, and 1970s, we had these super heavy launch capabilities with the Saturn V rocket and we were able to use that rocket to send people to the moon in the Apollo program. And what, you know, rockets like uh, like Starship and then also um, NASA's SLS rocket, they're, they're giving us that capability back again. And, you know, what we know is it's an incredibly expensive type of rocket to build and operate. And I think the question that SpaceX is taking on is, you know, can you reduce costs? Can you make it profitable? Um, and I think you could expect to see, um, you know, an increased cadence 
of launches after this. And then once we've got, you know, uh, confidence that the, that this is a safe launch vehicle, you'll start seeing humans fly. SpaceX needs to prove that Starship is 100% safe before it takes astronauts on board. And in order to do that, it needs to make sure it understands how the vehicle re-enters the atmosphere, both parts of the vehicle, the booster, and then the vehicle that's on top, the actual Starship. It needs to safely be able to re-enter the Earth's atmosphere and then land, whether it's landing in, in the ocean or whether it is you know, landing back on Earth. And in order to prove to itself that it's safe enough, it needs to do it in one of these test flights. So that's that last step that it did not accomplish today, but will hopefully accomplish in the near future. I mean, that's definitely been something that Elon Musk has promoted uh, ever since he introduced the idea of the Starship rocket, was that this would be a vehicle that would eventually give us the capabilities to send humans to Mars and to have a sort of ongoing um, transport between Earth and Mars. And so it does seem to be part of Elon's uh, long term uh, vision. But for now, I think uh, we're going to just have to wait and see how it does and, and how you know NASA's Artemis program fares in terms of becoming a sustainable program of lunar exploration. I would say that with this technology, if you can manage to make um, lunar exploration and lunar habitation sustainable, then yeah, Mars might be a logical next step. <laughs>